Good day, students. Welcome to our lesson on gluconeogenesis. Gluconeogenesis simply means the synthesis of new molecules of glucose. This process occurs in the cytoplasm of liver and kidney cells. And later on, we will learn why it is only the liver and the kidney who are able to catalyze gluconeogenesis. The primary goal of gluconeogenesis would be to maintain blood glucose levels in the absence of food intake. Remember that when you eat, and when you digest and absorb the food products, this will be in the form of glucose and that will be supplied by the venous blood of the intestines. Eventually, that glucose will reach the blood. It will be captured by the liver and that glucose in the blood will be taken up or absorbed by the different cells of the body utilized in the different metabolic pathways in those cells, thereby consuming glucose. But eventually, you have to understand also that we do not always eat all of the time. And there will be periods when we don't have food intake, and therefore those periods will have lower blood glucose levels. And therefore, there has to be a way that the body can maintain blood glucose levels. In general, there will be two primary ways. Number one is glycogenolysis. And that is the breakdown of the storage form of glucose, which is glycogen, in the liver. So, glycogen is slowly degraded and the glucose is liberated in the blood. But our body has a finite store of glycogen. In particular, the liver can only hold up to as much as 100 grams of glycogen. Some resources will um, even say that it is only 60 grams. This amount of glycogen is degraded within approximately 11 up to 24 hours. But there are periods, extreme periods, um, in the human where um, that person will not be able to eat. For example, when you are stranded in a desert or when you're undergoing a long operation where you don't have any food intake. And therefore, after 24 hours, almost all of that glycogen will already be degraded. And it is up now to gluconeogenesis um, to provide glucose in the blood. It is the only glucose source in a prolonged fast. Gluconeogenesis is energy expensive. It consumes 6 ATP molecules to be able to synthesize only one glucose molecule. Um, and it is powered by lipolysis. So what does this mean? When lipolysis or the breakdown of stored fat is occurring, there is a concomitant gluconeogenesis that is also occurring. Because that 6 ATP that you need to make glucose through gluconeogenesis will be supplied by breaking the bonds between a fatty acid in beta oxidation. Gluconeogenesis, as I have emphasized, is important for cells that cannot oxidize alternative fuel sources. A major example would be red blood cells, who in their development in the bone marrow have extruded almost all organelles so that there is space in the cytoplasm to hold hemoglobin. And therefore, red blood cells, the mature ones, only have hemoglobin in the cytoplasm and the cytosol. And therefore, it is only those metabolic processes that occur in the cytosol, which do not require other organelles, that occur in the red blood cells. And that would be glycolysis. Therefore, red blood cells will only be able to utilize glucose through glycolysis to produce its energy. Another organ that is highly dependent on glucose would be the brain. It is estimated that the brain utilizes up to 100 grams of glucose 
per day. And remember, we don't eat always. And therefore, it is the brain that actually consumes a lot of glucose when you don't have something to eat. And that is in the interdigestive phase between meals. And so, the body, because the brain is essential, would have to maintain glucose at appropriate levels. Okay, so now let's focus on this image on the right. You have here the center um, rectangle, and that is your liver cell. Now, um, first I want you to focus on the red blood cell, which is on top of the liver cell. Glucose enters, and it is degraded into pyruvate through glycolysis, and that produces ATP. Pyruvate will then be reduced to lactate, and it is lactate that the liver um, takes in. Lactate, through gluconeogenesis, will be able to produce glucose, which eventually will be spewed out of the liver cell again. Adipose tissue on the left lower uh, portion of this image, um, when you don't have something to eat, the triglycerides that are stored in the adipose tissue are broken down through lipolysis into individual fatty acids. And the fatty acids are liberated into the plasma as well as glycerol. So the glycerol backbone, again, will be taken up by the liver and converted into glucose through gluconeogenesis. The muscle is important because um, it is not only a consumer of energy, but it is also um, a source of substrates that we can use for gluconeogenesis. And that will be primarily in the form of amino acids, particularly alanine, um, which we will discuss later in the alanine glucose cycle. So that alanine will be converted into pyruvate, and pyruvate, again, will be converted into glucose. The muscle during exercise will also be able to produce lactic acid that the um, liver can convert again to glucose. And in this image, um, what is emphasized is that the brain only consumes glucose. So let's now go into the reaction process of gluconeogenesis. Gluconeogenesis is simply not the reverse of glycolysis because in glycolysis, there are three steps which are irreversible and therefore act as thermodynamic barriers. Why? Because in these stages, there is participation of ATP through hydrolysis of its bonds. So when the bonds of ATP are hydrolyzed, there is a lot of energy liberated. And therefore, the body has a hard time counteracting um, that process of energy liberation by ATP. And therefore, because of the large amount of heat and energy released by those processes, these processes in glycolysis are irreversible. And therefore, gluconeogenesis would have to bypass these three irreversible glycolytic reactions. Okay? So that means gluconeogenesis is not the simple reversal of glycolysis. So what are the bypass steps? Now I want you to focus your image um, I want you to focus your attention at the image in the right. And let's start at the bottom with pyruvate. The first step would be the conversion of pyruvate to phosphoenol pyruvate. Remember that in glycolysis, phosphoenol pyruvate creates substrate level phosphorylation to form pyruvate. Therefore, for this to be bypassed, it would have to um, proceed in a stepwise manner involving oxaloacetate. Pyruvate, through the action of pyruvate carboxylase, 
will form oxaloacetate and oxaloacetate through the reaction catalyzed by PEP carboxykinase utilizing guanosine triphosphate, oxaloacetate will become phosphoenol pyruvate. Okay, so that's a two-step reaction to bypass step number 10 of glycolysis. The next irreversible step would be the conversion of fructose 1,6-bisphosphate to fructose 6-phosphate. And that will be catalyzed by fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase. And then, glucose 6-phosphate will be converted to glucose through the action of glucose 6-phosphatase, which is preferentially expressed in the liver and in the kidney cells. In muscle cells, where there is a lot of glycogen being stored, because muscle cells do not express glucose 6-phosphatase, muscle cells are not able to contribute to plasma glucose because the glucose remains inside the skeletal muscle cell as glucose 6-phosphate. It has no way of being converted into glucose. Again, because it does not express glucose 6-phosphatase. So again, what are the three irreversible reactions and how do we bypass them? First would be pyruvate to PEP. So that is um, done through conversion of pyruvate to oxaloacetate and then PEP, phosphoenopyruvate. The next step that is irreversible would be um, conversion of fructose 1,6-bisphosphate to fructose 6-phosphate and we use a different enzyme, not PFK in glycolysis, but fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase. The last step would be conversion of glucose 6-phosphate to glucose and we use glucose 6-phosphatase. Now let's zoom in on the reversal of step number 10 of glycolysis. And this is through um, two bypass reactions. The first would involve production of oxaloacetate from pyruvate. If you will focus your attention on the image at the top, pyruvate has this particular structure. The action of pyruvate carboxylase would be to add a carboxyl group at the terminal position of pyruvate so that you will have oxaloacetate with one carboxyl group on one end and another carboxyl group on the other end. This step utilizes the energy from adenosine triphosphate and the carbon from bicarbonate. The next step would be to convert oxaloacetate to phosphoenol pyruvate. And this is done through the action of phosphoenol pyruvate carboxykinase. We're now going to remove that terminal carboxyl group which we added and um, attach a phosphate group. The donor of the phosphate group will be guanosine triphosphate. And we will end up with phosphoenol pyruvate which has a central phosphate. Remember that oxaloacetate comes from the Krebs cycle and therefore the Krebs cycle can donate oxaloacetate into gluconeogenesis. And therefore, what happens when gluconeogenesis is active or when gluconeogenesis is required by the body? Because oxaloacetate can come from the Krebs cycle during periods of a prolonged fast when you don't have something to eat, you will eventually be utilizing or depleting oxaloacetate from the Krebs cycle. And therefore, the Krebs cycle will slow down kasi wala nang oxaloacetate. So, with that happening, the Krebs cycle slowing down because of lack of oxaloacetate and acetyl coenzyme A being concomitantly produced by beta oxidation and remembering that 
acetyl coenzyme A is catered by the Krebs cycle, you will have an accumulation of acetyl coenzyme A. Beta oxidation produces acetyl coenzyme A, and the Krebs cycle is not able to handle all of that acetyl coenzyme A because its oxaloacetate is being taken up by gluconeogenesis. So we now have a setting for ketogenesis where the excess acetyl coenzyme A we use to combine to form ketone bodies, which we will discuss in a future lesson. What's special here in this image is that for us to produce phosphoenolpyruvate from oxaloacetate, we need guanosine triphosphate. There are only two cells in the body that are able to produce guanosine triphosphate through the Krebs cycle. And those cells are liver cells and kidney cells. That's why only the liver cell and the kidney cell can catalyze gluconeogenesis because it's the only two cells, two cells that um, are able to produce GTP. Next, let's now go to the regulation of gluconeogenesis. I have shown this image in our past lessons. And the goal of this image is to show you that glycolysis and gluconeogenesis occur um, through reciprocal regulation. When glycolysis is active, gluconeogenesis is slowed down. When gluconeogenesis is active, glycolysis is slowed down. So, for the regulation of gluconeogenesis, the body utilizes hormones and allosteric regulators. If we use the term allosteric, we are referring to substances that can directly affect the activity of an enzyme and therefore a pathway by binding to that enzyme in a different site. Okay? So remember that enzymes have an active site where the substrates attached to and thereby through that site become the product. But there are also other sites within that enzyme where substances can bind to and therefore produce a change in the activity of that enzyme. And that is what we call an allosteric site. So for gluconeogenesis, we use both hormones and allosteric regulators. Hormones act slowly, but they produce a prolonged effect. And therefore, hormones exert effects over hours to days. So what are the hormonal factors that stimulate gluconeogenesis? First would be a drop in insulin. When you don't have something to eat and the levels of glucose in the blood goes down, that will automatic, automatically alter the release of insulin from the pancreas. The pancreas will slow down its release of insulin and therefore the muscle and adipocyte will not be able to suck in glucose from the blood because there is lower insulin levels. And this will save glucose in the blood. Next, the body will then start to release counter-regulatory hormones. Counter-regulatory hormones are hormones that oppose the action of insulin. This is in the form of glucagon, which primarily stimulates glycogenolysis epinephrine, which stimulates beta oxidation or the breakdown of fatty acids to power gluconeogenesis and stimulate gluconeogenesis also. Glucocorticoids and growth hormone increase insulin resistance so that there is less insulin activity and more glucose stays in the blood. Furthermore, Glucocorticoids are important to facilitate 
the action of epinephrine plus stimulate the enzymes for gluconeogenesis. Growth hormone has a special effect because it not only increases blood glucose, but it also prevents the degradation of proteins so that the body in times of fasting will preserve its muscle mass and lean protein mass, example, the proteins in the organs and the proteins in the plasma, those are preserved in the face of growth hormone. So the body shifts from utilizing glucose to utilizing fatty acids, but at the same time, trying to conserve proteins. So that's the effect of these counter-regulatory hormones. So, so much for that. Let's put our attention on the image here in the right. And I want you now to focus um, letter A, the left side of letter A. During fasting, um, glucose 6-phosphate becomes glucose, and that's the process of gluconeogenesis. Gluconeogenesis is inhibited by insulin, and it's stimulated by glucagon and cortisol. Okay, so now let's put our attention to the uh, subset B of the image. We will understand from this image what allosteric regulators facilitate gluconeogenesis. So you will have higher gluconeogenesis or rate of gluconeogenesis if you have lots of acetyl coenzyme A, if you have glucagon, if you have ATP, which comes from beta oxidation, and if you have citrate. Okay, so lots of citrate means that the Krebs cycle is full. Therefore, it can donate oxaloacetate. Okay. Now let's go to glucose cycles. So in the body, there are specific communications involving glucose and substrates for gluconeogenesis between the liver and other extrahepatic tissues. Let's now um, talk about the Cori cycle. The Cori cycle is also known as the pyruvate lactate glucose cycle. So the Cori cycle delivers lactate to the liver and the liver converts that lactate into glucose and that glucose goes into the blood and now the extrahepatic tissues can utilize glucose again. So that's the core cycle. Here in this image, I want you to focus your attention first on the skeletal muscle at the right. Remember that skeletal muscle stores glycogen but it is not able to liberate glucose into the blood because it does not have phosphatase, glucose 6-phosphatase. So that glucose trapped in the skeletal muscle undergoes glycolysis. And during exercise, pyruvate, which is the end product of glycolysis, is converted to lactate. Lactate now goes into the blood and is transported into the liver. Lactate is oxidized into pyruvate, and pyruvate now goes up the ladder through the steps of gluconeogenesis, ending up with glucose 6-phosphate. But because the liver expresses glucose 6-phosphatase, it can then spew out into the blood glucose, which the muscle will again take up to produce lactate and therefore you have that cycle which involves lactate from the muscle and glucose from the liver so that's the Cori cycle okay now let's talk about the alanine cycle so the alanine cycle involves the amino acid alanine 
which is produced from pyruvate. So remember the structure of pyruvate? If you add an amino group to that, you form alanine. So alanine, therefore, can produce pyruvate by removing that amino group or NH2. So remember that alanine is an amino acid. And amino acids combine with each other to form the polymer, which is protein. Skeletal muscle has a lot of protein stores. So it stores amino acids as proteins. When you are in a fasted state, the skeletal muscle can degrade its stores of protein and liberate alanine, which is the amino acid. Alanine from the skeletal muscle goes into the blood and is taken up by the liver. The liver then removes the amino group and that amino group will be detoxified into urea. And remember, alanine comes from pyruvate. So if you remove that amino group, you will be able to form pyruvate, which then goes up the cycle or the steps of gluconeogenesis forming glucose 6-phosphate, which is then released from the liver through glucose 6-phosphatase and enters the blood as glucose, which is taken up again by the skeletal muscle through glycolysis producing pyruvate. And if you have enough protein source from the diet, aminate, Okay, so the, you have a transamination reaction with pyruvate to, to reform alanine. And therefore, you have a cycle of alanine from the skeletal muscle and glucose from the liver. Okay? So these are my references. And through this lesson, we have understood why it is important for the body to be able to generate glucose through glycogenolysis, which is finite, and gluconeogenesis, which occurs during a prolonged fast. Why? Because the brain and red blood cells have a hard time using other sources of energy. So gluconeogenesis is not merely the reverse of glycolysis because you have to bypass three irreversible steps of glycolysis. Step number 10, step number 3, and step number 1. Gluconeogenesis occurs only in the liver and the kidneys because it is only these two cells that produce guanosine triphosphate from the Krebs cycle. Because oxaloacetate can come from the Krebs cycle, gluconeogenesis will eventually deplete the intermediates of the Krebs cycle. And partner that with accumulating acetyl coenzyme A, you will be producing ketone bodies. So, gluconeogenesis is reciprocally regulated with glycolysis. When one is active, the other is inhibited. And this is through the action of hormones. Insulin will speed up glycolysis and slow down gluconeogenesis. We have glucose cycles, the Cori cycle, which utilizes pyruvate and lactate from the different cells of the body. And then that's taken up by the liver, where the liver catalyzes gluconeogenesis and returns into the blood glucose. You also have the alanine cycle, which mainly involves skeletal muscle, which releases alanine to the blood, taken up by the liver, converted into glucose through gluconeogenesis, and then reduced with extrahepatic tissues. So with that, um, we now end our lesson on gluconeogenesis. Thank you for listening.